morning. <coughs> My name is Franco Molteni. I also work at uh, the European Center. And uh, my role for a long time has been mainly in predictability studies and long-range forecasting. And uh, since the main topic of this particular workshop is the application of the OpenIFS to uh, seasonal forecasting, I thought you might want to hear more about some uh, recent projects that we are running and also some operational developments regarding uh, long-range forecasting and the simulation of uh, climate variability. So we'll present results from uh, different projects. And of course, as usual, at TCM, that we have, there are many colleagues involved uh, in, this, um, in these exercises. And I would like you know, to thank and acknowledge the contribution of a number of colleagues of mine. So <coughs> as Erland has anticipated, I will say a few more words on the new seasonal forecast system that uh, is going to be operational in uh, autumn 2017. Uh, this is a higher resolution system with respect to uh, the one we are running at the moment, but not as high as the resolution we use uh, for the medium range ensemble. So um, we wanted somehow to have an experimentation uh, about what advantage we could get on those time scales uh, if we could afford to run the same uh, resolution in both the atmosphere and the ocean uh, on the subseasonal and seasonal time scale. And so in, uh, in collaboration with the Center for Ocean Land Atmosphere Studies, um, which is hosted by uh, George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, uh, we made uh, a joint application to the NCAR Accelerated Scientific Discovery Program for a set of experiments that would basically run our uh, seasonal and subseasonal forecast system uh, at the resolution that we actually are using in the medium range. And this is the so-called METIS project. And I will say a few words. Uh, we are just basically finishing the integrations. And um, so this will just be a, a brief outline on, of, of the project. I don't have yet results. We still have to get. Um, the result from this uh, from this project, but just to make you aware of uh, what will be available in the near future. Then I will uh, mention uh, the runs that we are doing uh, in the Primavera project, which is a, a EU-funded project under the Horizon 2020 framework. And this is about simulation of climate variability with high-resolution couple models. And again, high resolution has a different meaning uh, when you talk about you know, uh, multi-decadal time scales. And so here the reference are basically the current resolution used in typically assume five experiments, which is on of the order of 100 kilometers for both the atmosphere and the ocean. And in Primavera, uh, we are running a, a new generation of uh, climate models at a resolution of the order of 25 kilometers, so about a quarter of a degree. And uh, mm, as I will explain this project as both a, a sort of historical component, so simulation of the climate up to uh, the current times, and then an extrapolation up to 2050 ECM that we have is only concerned with the historical part. But this will allow us basically to look at the performance of our model on uh, basically long integrations um, that we've never done before. So <coughs> let me start with the seasonal forecast system. Uh, this will be called System 5. Uh, as Erland mentioned, we started uh, doing operational ensemble predictions in 1997-98. Uh, 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 we were convinced, you know, we managed to convince our council to allow us to do so thanks to the very good simulations of the 97-98 El Nino that were done with the first version of this WF coupled system. And uh, so uh, this will be the fifth realization of, of this system. It will use a very uh, recent uh, model cycle, the one which is operational at the moment. Uh, we will also use the new um, approach to the numerics that Erlan has, has um, described, so the use of an octahedral grid uh, with a cubic type resolution, which means that we can actually uh, compute exactly up to a third order terms on the grid. So um, 
Although in terms of the spectral truncation, the difference is not very large. So uh, system four was running uh, with a spectral truncation of 255. Uh, the new system will run with a spectral truncation of T319. However, the resolution of the grid used has uh, improved substantially from 80 kilometers to about 35. The number of atmospheric levels is unchanged. Uh, we tested the version with 137 levels, but somehow uh, for reason of um, basically availability of, of computer time, we had to limit ourselves to the 91 version. The ocean resolution has increased substantially, so we still use the NEMO model uh, in a more recent version. But uh, instead of using the one degree uh, configuration, we are now using a quarter of a degree. And this allows us to represent you know, the, the, the fronts and the sharp gradients in the SST uh, in a much better way. Another big improvement is that in system four, we didn't actually predict dynamically the evolution of the sea ice. We were just uh, uh, starting from observed condition and assuming that uh, over basically the time of one season, the sea ice will evolve in a way similar to what happened in the past five years. You know, so we, we, are, we were picking up uh, sea ice distributions from the previous five years. Now, uh, with System 5, we will have a dynamical sea ice model. It's the LIM2 model, which has been extensively used uh, by the NEMO community. And so we will have dynamical predictions of sea ice ev evolution. Uh, you're probably aware that when we run seasonal forecast system, we have to run a reforecast in the past to calibrate uh, our system. Uh, for system four, the calibration, the reforecast period was uh, 30 years uh, from, nine, from um, 1981 to 2010. Um, for system five, we are just extending it basically to, to the present. Uh, the reforecast ensemble size will also increase from 15 members to 25 members. So um, we are actually started running this operational reforecast. Uh, we started with the, uh, the reforecast uh, for the summer season. Then we'll go into the autumn season. This will be the first ones that will be needed to issue uh, operational forecast in the autumn. So <clears throat> as Ellen mentioned, one of the big improvements that we saw with this new model was the strong uh, reduction of the biases in the tropics and in particular in the equatorial cold tone. In system four, this resulted from a combination of uh, two strong trade winds uh, in the atmospheric model and also some uh, deficiency in the ocean model. Now, there have been uh, advances in both directions, uh, but I would say that both components have, have, have improved and the result now, uh, as you can see, uh, from the panels on, on the right hand side is that the, you know, the strong cold bias that we had, particularly uh, in the Nino 3 region, have now been uh, replaced uh, either by a slight warm bias uh, during uh, the northern winter in DJF uh, at the top or a much, much reduced uh, cold bias along the equator uh, in, the, um, in the summer season. Another area where we were expecting to see improvements are the regions of the western boundary currents because these are regions with sharp gradients that are not well resolved by the a one degree model. Uh, you can see here that there is in fact um, a reduction in the bias uh, in the region of the Gulf Stream. Uh, we were perhaps hoping that the reduction would be even stronger. Uh, we still have some problems to uh, solve in this, uh, in this region, but definitely uh, you can see uh, that the, uh, the amplitude of the bias uh, has been reduced. Um, some other improvements have come from uh, an improved mixing in the ocean mix layer. Uh, we have developed uh, a new uh, parameterization of the mixing, which also gets information from the wave model in an interactive way. And this has, uh, has been instrumental in reducing the bias we had, a warm bias we had uh, in the North Pacific and the North Atlantic uh, during uh, the uh, summer season. So I will 
go briefly with this slide because you have, you have just seen it. Um, one addition is actually the, 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 the stop diagram that uh, Erland has now shown, and that is the uh, impact that this bias reduction has had on the amplitude of El Nino. So uh, you, you have seen these two graphs, and so you have seen that uh, we have a, a, a slight but significant improvement in the anomaly correlation, but actually a much bigger improvement in the RMS error. And the reason is that uh, because of the uh, cold bias, uh, system 4 was overpredicting the amplitude of El Niños. And you can think that because, you know, El Nino comes basically from the oscillation of the Pacific thermocline, and basically the maximum event you can get is when the thermocline is almost horizontal. So if you're in your mean state the thermocline is already too tilted, uh, then basically you, you have the possibility of creating very large positive anomalies um, when the thermocline almost uh, flattens. And this is, in fact, what happened in, in System 4. We tended to over-represent the, uh, the amplitude of the big uh, El Nino events. This was particularly evident in the range uh, from, month two, uh, from month 2 to month 5. Uh, and that is, uh, so you can see um, in, in, in this diagram here, the curve for the amplitude of, of uh, System 4, you, you see that it reached almost 40 percent more than, uh, than the observation. Um, system 5 is much closer to uh, the unity, so it means that the amplitude is, uh, is much closer to, to reality. And so basically the reduction in the RMS error comes from the fact that although you know, the, the, the sequence of the time revolution, evolution was also reason, reasonably well predicted by system 4, uh, sometimes this happened with the too large amplitude and this particular error has been now uh, substantially reduced. Um, we were expecting improvements because of the use of a dynamical CIS model, and certainly this has been verified. So uh, if you look, for example, at the anomaly correlation of, of CIS cover uh, during the northern winter, um, you, uh, you see that even with this uh, sort of basic system, we had some predictability in the variation, for example, in the CARA and, and Barents Sea, which are quite, uh, <coughs> it's quite an important regions for the connection to the North Atlantic oscillation. But clearly, uh, we get a much better uh, simulation of these variations uh, with the dynamical CS model. And this is one area that I think will be explored by uh, some of the people here with the open IFS. Now, not everything has improved uh, as you know it's a common experience when you when you change a uh, very complex model some of the biases remain similar in character for example we still tend to have an overestimation uh, in the amount of precipitation we model from the tropics so you can see here the biases in precipitation with respect to gpcp uh, system four again on the left system five on the right and you you can see that uh, the, the character of, of the bias has not changed uh, dramatically. Perhaps a, an, uh, another area where we, I think we have to understand why uh, things have not changed very much, are the teleconnections uh, associated uh, with convection over the Indian Ocean, and especially from uh, MJO activities. Um, it's well known that uh, uh, enhanced convection uh, in, the, uh, in the Indian Ocean, which is usually associated with phase two and phase three of the MJO, tends to produce a positive NAO signal after about 10, 15 days. Um, and as if we actually look at the observation and if we composite the anomaly of geopotential height at 500 hectopascal, uh, 10 days after and MJO in phase three, we see this very strong uh, NAO signal here. If you actually look at the two top maps that come from a similar analysis in system four and five, you see uh, a positive NAO signal, but I would say roughly half. The amplitude is about half of the observation. And this is an aspect which has not been uh, substantially improved uh, in the new system. Although I have to say the teleconnections from uh, the Cor Nino regions have actually improved uh, due to the better representation of, of El Nino. Um, another 
important phenomenon for Europe is blocking, uh, particularly during the winter period when it can be associated with, with cold spells, quite intense cold spells. Um, here is a plot of the frequency of simulated blocking um, using the Tivaldi Molteni index, which is now 30 years old, but still in use. And you can see that there are uh, some areas of improvement, like in the Northwest Atlantic, these are the so-called Greenland blocks, uh, and, and the Pacific. Um, not so much in the, uh, actually, on the eastern side of uh, the Atlantic. Um, in fact, see that the area of, of improvement are those when the blockings are more associated with large-scale variations in, in planetary waves, the, the European blocking is a much more non-linear process, you know, due to the interaction with the transient eddies. Um, so we, we still have some work to do. We have to say that uh, usually the, the winter seems to be, for our model, the most critical season. We had actually much better result from uh, autumn and, and, and spring. Okay, um, just a few mentions because we have not got results yet uh, from this uh, METIS project. But again, to, to restate, this is a, a collaborative project with COLA, uh, funded by the Anchor um, Accelerated Scientific Discovery Call. Uh, it's a collaboration with, uh, also with Anchor, in the sense that Anchor is, is doing similar kind of experiments with their model. So um, the team from COLA was led by Ben Cash and Jim Kinter, and on, uh, on our side, in addition to myself, uh, Roberto Buizza was also involved in the planning, and uh, Sami Sarinen actually produced a version of our model that could run on the NCAR computer, and Damien Decremer has provided uh, the data for uh, initial conditions for these experiments. So this is what... Uh, we can say we have actually done most of it. Uh, is, is a combination of six months and two months experiment. The six months experiment only have two start dates, uh, May and November. Uh, they cover a 30 year period, uh, 1986 to 2015, with an ensemble of uh, 25 members, and the focus go up to uh, six months. In addition to that, for each of the two seasons, uh, we also run shorter a two-month uh, integration starting from uh, June, July, August for the summer, December, January, and February for the winter. And these experiments are uh, done uh, with the resolution of, again, you know, order, um, you know, 100 kilometers as a reference. And these are done with the uh, cubic grid at T199. Uh, but the core experiments are the ones with the uh, cubic grid at T639, uh, which gives a, a resolution of about 18 kilometers. This is a very high resolution for seasonal predictions. And um, so we hope to see some good results from this set of, uh, of experiments. So we will be able to assess the impact of using a high uh, re resolution in both the atmosphere and the ocean throughout uh, the uh, integration. Um, also plan are some integrations with basically the highest resolution we are running operationally at the moment, TCO 1279. Uh, we could only uh, afford to do two months uh, uh, with 15 members. And actually, um, this is what was planned. In total, this project requires almost 60 million core hours that we were allocated. Uh, Actually, what we managed to do were all the uh, low and uh, sort of high resolution runs. For the very high resolution runs, uh, we have been able with this allocation to do the winter runs and the, the summer runs will actually be done in the near future with an extended allo uh, allocation for this project. So I don't have yet results from this project, but I have some results from uh, the Primavera Horizon 2020 project. Um, and this is uh, the main goal of this project is to develop a new generation of high resolution global climate models. Um, and the hope is that this high resolution will be able to simulate the climate with higher fidelity than what we get from uh, the sort of CIMI 5 generation. 
So for us, you know, ECMWF is not in the climate change business, but of course we want to evaluate the quality uh, of our couple system and to see, uh, to study its attractor. You know, when we do subseasonal or seasonal predictions, uh, our couple system uh, basically drifts from uh, the initial conditions, which are on the real atmospheric attractor, towards uh, the model attractor. But because the ocean has very long time scales inherent, we actually never see in the seasonal prediction the asymptotic climate of the model. So uh, we can study the start of this climate drift in our couple system, but just from seasonal prediction, we cannot see what the asymptotic state of the climate is. So uh, this is, was our motivation for participating in, in Primavera. And so um, in Primavera, the goal is to do um, simulation that cover a 100-year period, as I will show in the next slide. We are only doing the historical part, and we are doing again with two different resolutions. Again, TCO199 uh, as a reference. Again, as I said, typical CIMI5 resolution. Uh, and then, uh, well, given the length of the time scale, we cannot afford to do T6, uh, TCO639. But uh, we are using the TCO399, which, is, uh, which actually gives, gives us a grid resolution of about a quarter of a degree. So this is a good match to the ocean uh, resolution of the NEMO model we are using in these experiments. So this is the schematic of the so-called stream one integrations uh, that will have to be delivered by uh, October uh, this year. So we have a set of at uh, AMIP type integrations, so only atmospheric uh, and land. Uh, SST is prescribed. Uh, basically from uh, the head ISST2 data set that has been adopted for CMIP6 experiment. And so uh, the historical part will cover 1950 to 2014 uh, with CMIP6 uh, radiative forcing. And then um, this will be extended uh, with forcing provided by, by the CMIP, one of the CMIP6 scenarios uh, up to 2050. Similar runs will be done uh, in couple mode, so starting from 1950, but because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the ocean has some long adjustment time scale, we need to run a spin-up period. For this particular experiment, we chose not to run the very long, you know, hundreds of years uh, spin-up, which is done uh, in some, by most of the semi participating groups, but rather to do a shorter uh, spin-up, 30 to 50 years with constant 1950 forcing, and then to continue actually uh, this run as a control experiment. And also at some point to branch off, start to apply time varying radiative forcing, again provided by CMIP6, and then uh, run the model into the future. And uh, again, the CMWF will only run up to 2014. So, uh, okay, coming back. We have some runs completed, so we have completed um, five members of the AMIP at TCO199, three members at T399. Actually, we have completed two and one is, is in the machine. Um, and we've also completed a couple of spin-up, which is a single run, both with low resolution and a high resolution. And for the ocean, low resolution is one degree, and high resolution is a quarter of a degree. Now, um, I mentioned before that we were expecting uh, to see a reduction of the bias in the North Atlantic due to the introduction of the quarter degree model. There was some ev evidence in the seasonal forecast, but perhaps there is even more evidence uh, uh, here in, in the long runs. Uh, oh, so these are maps of the SST biases from uh, this first, basically, 50 years of spin-up of the couple system. Um, and of course, the, the spin-up is a bit of artificial period because you know it has forcing fixed at 1950. So you don't have an exact realization of that in the real atmosphere. But basically, uh, here the data are compared with SST in the 1950 decades uh, from the N4 data set. And um, if, you, if you look here at this big blue blob, this is the low resolution run. Um, you see that there's quite a substantial bias throughout the North Atlantic in the low-resolution model. And if you look here at the high-resolution model, 
uh, you see that this has been uh, substantially reduced. So when you let the model uh, adjust, you see perhaps, we see perhaps more clearly the positive impact of the high resolution in, uh, in the ocean. Now, one, uh, um, another advantage which is related to this is the fact that the higher resolution is much better able to maintain the strength of the meridional overturning circulation. Um, so you see here the um, intensity, the overturning stream function from the low resolution run on the left and the high resolution on, on the right. You can see from the number of isolines that uh, the high resolution has a, a higher intensity. And if we actually plot uh, the strength of the transport in Sverdrup at 26 degrees north, um, we can see that basically in the low resolution run there is a pretty long uh, adjustment with the decline of the intensity of the MOC to about two-thirds uh, of what we expect from observations. Uh, when we do the, uh, the high resolution run, there's, there's some adjustment uh, in, uh, in the first, say, 15 years, but then the model stabilizes and it stabilizes with uh, an average uh, transport of about 16 sphere drops, which is quite good, in, in pretty good agreement with observational estimates. Um, another advantage of running a coupled system with respect to running an AMIP system is that you can actually, but also the difficulty is that, is that uh, in an AMIP system you prescribe SST, so the warming of the SST is actually defined by the SST you, you prescribe. Uh, in the atmospheric model, the warming will come from the combination of the effect of this SST and also of the forcing. Uh, the radiative forcing that are prescribed. These two things can actually have be slightly different. So you may have a slightly different uh, trends in temperature in the prescribed SST and in the atmosphere above the sea. And this actually uh, is, is uh, reflected in, uh, uh, in, in the fact that the transfer, the so-called non-solar heat flux, so the sum of latent sensible heat and net um, long wave radiation at the surface of the ocean actually takes some time to actually uh, adjust uh, to uh, a fixed value. And this is because of this slightly, you know, you need just a slightly different trends in the prescribed SST and, and the atmospheric flow to actually change uh, this balance by a few watts per, uh, per square meter. Now, if you instead you actually look at what you get from the couple run, uh, then um, you can actually see that the, uh, again, after uh, um, about 10, 15 years, uh, the curve of the non-solar heat flux uh, is as essentially doesn't have any, any trend. Of course, it has decadal oscillation because there is internal decadal variability. Um, ideally, the red and the blue curve should overlap uh, to have uh, an exact balance. Um, but actually, if you, you cannot read the scale, but the difference is about one watt per square meter. Now, um, half of it is actually uh, a sort of post-processing deficiency. This, uh, to actually compute exactly the balance, you should actually add to these three terms that I mentioned, the basically melting of snow over the ocean, because that is an additional contribution to the surface heat balance. And that accounts for about a bit less than half a watt per square meter. So if I have added that, then the difference would only be half of watt per square meter. And that is, in fact, a residual that is within the observational estimates because the Earth is warming. So if, if we had an exact balance between the heat that the ocean receives and what it loses, then the ocean would not warm. But in practice, the ocean has warmed because of you know, global warming. And in fact, the estimate is that on average, you have an imbalance at the surface of about half a watt per square meter. So when we, uh, th this particular difference, uh, when we take these two effects in, into account, is, is something that we would sort of uh, expect. You can also see here the variation in uh, uh, two meter temperature over land. This is the variation of the SST produced by the model. Uh, the green line that is almost overlapping, you can see, is basically the two meter temperature of air over the sea. Um, this gray curve 
is the a measure of the fraction of sea ice cover over the northern extra tropics. So as you expect, you would have a sea ice decline. And I think one interesting thing that I would like you to notice in this graph, you know, this is a simulation of coupled internal variability with no variation in external forcing. And when you have such, if you remove this external variation, then the decadal variability of temperature over land is almost exactly in phase with the variation of temperature over the sea. And this is something that a number of authors have actually argued that you can very well model the, basically the warming over land if you know what the warming over sea is. And you know, for example, Prussian Sardeshmuk has argued this for, for quite some time. But this has also been revived by the recent debate about the, the hiatus. So um, if you know what your ocean does and how your ocean transfers heat to the atmosphere, then you are able to a very good extent to predict what the warming over land will be, and not only its long-term trend, but also its decadal variability. Now let's move to more regional indices. And of course, you have a coupled system. You want to know whether you get a good El Nino or not. And um, so at the top here, you see uh, the plot of the El Nino 3.4 SST anomaly from our Remy plan. So in this case, it's not a model simulation. You know, this is actually prescribed. Uh, from the uh, had, um, had ISST2 data set. So you see the peaks in the major El Nino events. Actually, it turns out that if you look to the Nino 3.4, and even more so if you look at the Nino 4, uh, the, uh, some of the later El Ninos actually have a stronger signal. This is because in recent years we have a more, you know, stronger prevalence of SST anomalies in the central part of the Pacific. You know, some events that people call El Nino Modoki, uh, rather than um, El Nino events that were occurring earlier. So if you actually look uh, more towards the central part of, of the Pacific, some of the more recent events uh, become more prominent with respect, for example, to the 9283. Now, what is the couple model doing? Uh, again, this is, so this is unconstrained, a free run of the couple system. And the bottom graph shows you the, the uh, 3.4 SST anomaly from the spin-up run. Uh, I skip the first 10 years. Um, again, I mentioned that yeah, probably for another 10 years, the model is adjusting. But you can see that basically after sort of 15 years into the run, then you have a rather realistic um, variability of El Nino with uh, actually peaks of about 2.5 degrees, which are comparable with the uh, with strong El Nino cases, like the 2015-16. And actually, in this integration, we actually happen to have three pretty strong um, El Ninos uh, separated by about five to six years, and then periods of more moderate uh, events. So it will be interesting to see what happens you know, continuing when we continue this, uh, these integrations. Also, the, the, the patterns, so we have looked at the, uh, basically the connection between uh, the SST in these regions and the precipitation uh, in, in these regions. And um, so these are maps that basically that show the, uh, the covariance between uh, SST in the Nino 4 region um, and SST everywhere, or for the bottom panel, the covariance of SST here with precipitation everywhere else. Uh, so here you see the result from the Amy Pran. So in this case, again, this is just the result of the prescribed SST. Um, on the uh, right hand side, I've put panels from the era interim period. And here the difference comes from the fact that era interim used different SST, but also that era interim focuses on, um, it's only available uh, from uh, 79 onwards. And in this period, we actually had three pretty strong uh, El Nino events. So the amplitude of El Nino computed from just the last three decades is actually a bit larger than the amplitude that you get if you extend back to uh, 1951. So if you uh, look to, uh, to the simulation of the precipitation anomalies, which are uh, induced by this SST anomaly, you see that the model uh, is doing quite a good job. 
we were somehow expecting this because we were not expecting dramatic differences in our Remy plans with respect to our seasonal forecast. But the good news is that even when you do this exercise with the coupled system, you get some very uh, realistic teleconnections. And um, so now even the, uh, the SST map is produced by the model. So basically this tells you what is the, uh, the correlation between the uh, Nino 4 SST and SST everywhere else. And uh, you can see that you know, the structure is actually quite realistic. And also, the, uh, the, the precipitation associated with, with these anomalies is, um, is actually quite good. OK, let me skip the Indian Ocean in the interest of, of time. Let's move to uh, the northern extratropics. Um, one characteristic of recent versions of the CMWF model is a very good climate. Uh, for the northern extratropics. And uh, you can see here a map of mean geopotential height at 500 hectopascal. Uh, on the left hand side is the, the climate of the Amy Pran. Uh, so we have at the moment two members uh, run up you know, 1950 to 2014. So we have about 130 years uh, simulation. And these are compared, in this case, I wanted to have you know, a, a map which is actually for those particular years. So I actually took the data not from IRA interim, but from one, uh, our latest uh, 20th century reanalysis with the coupled uh, IRA 20C. Uh, and that gives a more comparable um, uh, map. And you can see at the bottom right the difference between the two. The uh, contour interval is about 10 meters. So you have a maximum biases. The maximum features are of the order plus or minus 30 meters, which is quite a good uh, result. But uh, yeah, perhaps we were even more positively surprised by the fact that even the couple system has uh, a bias which does not exceed 30 to 40 meters, which again is a sign that the, the climate of the system is uh, reasonably stable. Um, in this case, as I mentioned, there is no constant 1950 realization in, in the atmosphere. So if you actually take the fields without doing any correction, the whole map of the difference will turn out to be blue. Because a 1950 atmosphere is colder than a current atmosphere, and therefore the geopotential height will be a bit lower. So what I did is that I actually applied the correction by basically uh, recentering this map at the center of uh, the periods covered by these two uh, reanalyses by using the mean trend in geopotential height estimated from the uh, CIRA 20C. And if you do that, then you see structures like the one uh, you have seen. Uh, you can actually notice that the bias is actually smaller if I compare the system with the um, era interim period. Um, and that, we think, is uh, because the model actually had uh, three strong El Ninos during this, this first uh, uh, spin-up period. And so uh, because of the ENSO teleconnections, uh, the geopotential height looks actually more comparable to the geopotential height in a period when we had three strong El Ninos. In fact, if you actually look at this particular map of bias, this looks very much like an El Nino teleconnection. So we actually think that maybe uh, some of these features may even be reduced in a longer run of the system if a more balanced uh, alternation of strong and weak El Nino will, will come out. We have looked at uh, individual modes of variability, um, like the uh, North Atlantic oscillation doing EOF analysis and again covariance analysis. And again, the, the result, the good news is that the results of the coupled system are actually comparable to results of the AMIP and again, you know, pretty good uh, agreement with, with observations. I think I will, just in the interest of time, uh, get to the summary. So <clears throat> we have seen basically three sets of, of big experimentations, one devoted to the improvement of our seasonal forecast system. The other two are actually research experiments. So the new seasonal forecast system that we are going to introduce in autumn shows reduced bias in tropical SST, improves skill in ENSO prediction with respect to the current system. Performance in the northern extant tropics is, I would say, comparable. Some aspects are improved. Some aspects are not improved. 
But definitely, if you are interested in the tropical um, couple system, uh, it's definitely a, a, a better performing system. The METIS experiment uh, have just been finished. We are going to assess the results in the next few months. And so we will basically be able to see the benefits of using high resolution uh, as we use in the medium range ensemble, but when we extend this to the sub-seasonal and seasonal range. And then from the Primavera project, we will be able to assess the climatology of our system basically once it reaches its asymptotic or near equilibrium state, of course, you know, the deep ocean may still drift, but at least the upper ocean will be in a reasonable balance. And uh, um, so at, at the moment, we have just run uh, a couple of spin up, but the, as I showed, the preliminary assessment of this run with constant 1954 thing shows encouraging results in the sense that the model climate stabilizes af after about 20 years and the biases are comparable with those of AMIP experiments. So we will be able to, to use these runs actually to assess uh, really well you know, the climate of our coupled system uh, for long time scales and, and see what kind of errors the model simulates once it is basically allowed to adjust uh, to its own climate. And that's it for me.